everybody um i've had a couple of technical uh, glitches as normal so i'm hoping you can all hear me um and today i'm going to do rumpelstiltskin and then i'm going to do theseus and the minotaur and rumpelstiltskin is it's a very very old story i think it probably originates in germany and it's about an imp and a miller's daughter. I've never been quite happy with the way it uh, ends, so I've twiddled with it a bit, but then that's what you'd expect from me. So, welcome everybody, and I am Beth Webb. I'm an author and a storyteller, and today I'm going to start with Rumpelstiltskin. There was once a miller, and he was a very vain man, Nothing was ever quite good enough for him. And he had a very beautiful daughter. And although she had many suitors, none of them were quite good enough for her either. It's not that she was vain, it's just her father insisted that everything had to be done his way. Nothing was ever good enough. She began to despair of ever getting a husband. She was very beautiful and she got long golden hair that looked like spun gold. And that gave her father an idea. He went around saying that she was so clever that she could spin ordinary straw into gold. And he hoped by spreading a story like this that some very rich person would come to hear of it and he would actually come and overlook the girl's humble beginnings and take her as his wife, because not only was she beautiful, but she was extraordinarily clever. What a silly man, boasting about things that weren't true. Well, the girl was utterly miserable. But the father's plan worked. Lots of people heard of her skill, including the king. Now, the king wasn't married. He was quite a young man. He hadn't been king for long. And he was very greedy. And he was also very, very fond of gold. And when he heard that the girl was beautiful and had hair like gold and could spin straw into gold, oh, it couldn't have been better. He was over the moon. He was determined to come and see this girl. So he had all his men get their horses ready and he rode out to the mill. Well, the miller didn't know the king was coming. But he very quickly told his daughter to put on her best dress and come out and curtsy, which she did. And as she curtsied, the sunlight caught on her golden hair and it glinted so gorgeously, the king thought he was possibly in love. But as she was a poor girl and had no diary, he had to have proof that this spinning straw into gold story was true. So he asked the girl straight, can you do it? Horrified, the girl looked at her father and he went, and she was obedient sort of girl, so she did as she was told. And the king said, good, very well, come and I will take you to the palace and I will put you to the test and if you really can spin straw into gold, then we shall be married. Of course, the girl was terrified. She didn't know how to do this. But she very obediently got into a little carriage that had been bought and went to the palace with the king. The king made sure she had food and a comfortable place to rest. And he said, tonight, after supper, I will take you down to a cellar and I will have it filled with straw. And if you manage to fill it with gold in the morning, then we shall be wed. The girl was terrified. He knew, she knew. <coughs> The girl was terrified. She knew that if she didn't do this, then she'd be in big trouble. But come nightfall, the king himself escorted the girl down to the cellar and it was filled with straw and there was lanterns on the walls. So the light was reasonable and a very nice swim and a very nice spinning wheel. Well, the girl sat down with shaking hands and she looked at the king and said, um, Sire, may I be left alone, please? The king smiled and said, Of course. If you need any food or drink, just ring this bell. 
Well, as soon as the king had gone, the girl just burst into tears. She didn't know how to spin straw into gold, and she knew if she rang the bell, nobody would let her out, because everybody believed the story. And she cried and she cried. And then a little while later, she heard light footsteps, and she looked up, and there was a little imp. He'd got very straw-like hair and a long pointy nose and rather red, mean little eyes. Oh, and he smelt. She thought he probably had never washed, ever. But anyway, she, excuse me, <coughs> this little imp trotted up to the girl and said, Hmm, you got a problem then, my dear? And she looked at the imp and there was no one else asking if she was all right, so she said, well, not not really. Um, I've got to spin this straw into gold and I don't know how to begin. And the little imp looked around and sniffed and he wiped his mucky hands together and he said, well, I can do it for you dead easy, but I need paying. Well, I haven't got anything much, she said. And he looked at her and he said, you've got a pretty necklace on, but my mother gave me that before she died. And the imp said, please yourself. And then the girl thought, well, her mother would probably want her to give the necklace if it was going to keep her safe. So she took it off and handed it to him. And then the little imp sat down in the chair by the, by the spinning wheel and began to work. The wheel went round and the treadle went up and down, up and down, up and down. And to the girl's amazement from the other end of the spinning wheel, there was endless gold thread being spun onto the spindle. And he filled spindle after spindle after spindle until by the time the cock crowed and light was beginning to come in the windows, there was a pile of gleaming golden spindles and not a single piece of straw left. And then the little man jumped up left the spinning wheel, bowed very politely, but in a rather mocking way, and disappeared through the wall. Well, the girl was left astounded, and about an hour later, she heard footsteps in the corridor, and the key turned, and there stood the king. And he was amazed, for not only was the girl looking more beautiful than ever, her golden hair was loose and looked all disarrayed where she rubbed her, her, her fingers through the hair, but there was this huge heap of spun gold on spindles. Ah, oh, my dear, he said, you've done very well. I shall make sure you are allowed to have a nice warm bath and some breakfast. And the girl curtsied and followed the king upstairs, and she was taken to the room where she was fed and allowed a warm bath, but she wasn't let go or invited to be wed. A little later in the day, the king came, and he got a greedy glint in his eye and said, now, I'm sure you'll understand that last night was just a, a little test. You know, I didn't want to put you in the deep end first, but we've got an awful lot of straw in this kingdom, and it all needs to be turned into gold. The girl didn't know what to do. She, she thought she was going to faint. She went white and she went wobbly, and the king said, Well, you needn't spin it all at once. Perhaps tonight and tomorrow night, maybe? The girl was shaking and, and trying very hard not to cry, but the king didn't notice. All he could think about was gold. And so that night the girl was led down into another cellar, bigger than the last, and it was stuffed floor to ceiling with straw. And she sat, and as soon as the door was closed, she wept and wept and wept. But then she heard a rustle, and a rustle and a bustle, and... There was the little imp with his pointy nose and his mean red eyes, rubbing his fingers together, saying, Oh, it's a bit more today. What will you give me today? And the girl immediately took off her ring and held it out and said, This is the last thing I've got of my mother's. You shall have it if you can spin this into gold. And so the imp said, Ah, that'll do. Put in his pocket, sat at the spinning wheel, and he began to spin and spin and spin. And he seemed to work so fast the girl could hardly see his fingers moving. And soon it, she heard cock crowing. And soon she heard the cock crow. And light started to seep in through the window. And the girl rubbed her eyes for she must have dropped off. 
and the straw was almost all gone, and there was the little man, still spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning so fast. And there was a huge heap of spindles full of gold. The girl watched in absolute amazement. And as the light crept in, the last wisp of straw went through the wheel and flicked onto the spindle. There must have been hundreds of spindles full of gold thread. And once more, the little man got up and bowed in a very mocking way and disappeared through the wall. Well, the girl stood there in amazement but such gratitude. And then the door opened and the king came in and once more he smiled, seeing the light shining on the girl's golden hair. And he smiled even more as he saw the piles of gold thread. Well done, he said. I think you deserve a good breakfast and a good meal and a good rest before tonight's work. What? said the girl. Well, as he said, as I said yesterday, there's a lot of straw that needs to be spun into gold. Come on, dear, time for breakfast. The girl was horrified. But after she'd eaten and had her bath, she began to rub her hands up and down the wall of her room until the skin started to come off and was raw. And that evening, when the king turned up to take her down to a third cellar, he noticed her hands were raw. And he said, why are your hands like that? And she said, oh, it's, it's all the spinning, sire. It will pass off. Hmm, said the king. And he opened the door to a third cellar. Oh, it was so jam-packed full of straw, there was hardly room for the spinning wheel. But the girl had to sit down and the door was locked behind her. And this time, in a blink of an eye, the little imp was there looking meaner and smelling worse than before. And he said, right, what will you give me this time? And she said, I haven't got anything. Um, I, I, I just haven't got anything. I can give you a kiss. And he said, that won't do. We don't want to kiss you. And she said, well, I, I've, I've got nothing. And then the imp said, I tell you what, I could do with a good servant. So, if you... Do, if this is done tonight and the king is happy, he will marry you. He'll keep his promise. But when you have your firstborn child, I will come and take him when he's a week old. And he will be my servant. I'll look after him. He'll have a dry cave and dry straw to sleep on. He'll work hard, but I'm a good master. The girl was horrified, but what could she do? Very well, she said, thinking and hoping she'd have time to think her way out of it. And the little imp sat down and began to spin and spin and spin. And while he worked, the girl very quietly rubbed her hands even more against the wall. And this wall was a lot rougher than her bedroom wall. And her hands began to bleed and her nails were beginning to bleed and the fingers were cracking at the end. And she made sure they were really, really sore. It hurt so much, but it was going to be worth it. And when the little man had finished at dawn, the king came in, just as the little man disappeared through the wall. And he was astounded, absolutely over the moon, because all the straw had gone and it was stuffed with gold thread. And he took the girl's hand and he said, right, come upstairs, we shall have a banquet and later today we shall be wed. And then once more he looked at her hands and realised they were worse than before. And he said, why are your hands in such bad condition? What, what have you done to them? And she said, sire, as I told you yesterday, it's the, it's the spinning straw into gold. I can do it, but it, the magic is so rough and so harsh. If I do this very often, my hands will become knotted and sore and bony. And if I do it every day for a year, then I will be an old woman by the end of the year. Because the magic just drains whoever does it. And the king was horrified at this. He rather liked this beautiful young girl with her long golden hair and her fine looks. He wasn't ready to be wed to an old woman. So he said, very well, you've paid your dowry. I have enough gold to pay for the dowry. 
there will be no more spinning straw into the gold. And hiding her smile, the girl curtsied very low and said, Thank you, sire. And later that day, dressed in a fine white silk dress and with white silk gloves to cover her sore hands, the miller's daughter and the king were wed. Now about a year later, as happens, the girl gave birth to a baby, a fine little boy, and she hoped and prayed that the imp would have forgotten their bargain. But magical creatures rarely do. When the baby was about a week or so old, the little imp appeared in her room and said, Right, give him to me. I've come to get him. And the girl cried and cried, but she'd been expecting this, and, and she opened a box of jewels that the king had given her as a wedding gift, and she said, Please take all of these. Just leave me my baby. And he said, I've got jewels. I can make gold out of straw. What do I want that for? I want a human slave. That's what I want. Give him to me. That was the deal. And she said, Please, I beg you. The king is not an easy man, and and he will blame me if the child goes missing, and I'll be in such dreadful trouble. Please, I beg you. And she got down on her knees and knelt before the imp and said, Please. And the imp, who couldn't bear to see women crying, said, All right, all right, I'll tell you what. I'll give you three days to guess my name. And if at the end of three days I'll come in the morning of the fourth day, if you can tell me my name, I will let you off. The girl thanked him and curtsied to him very deeply, and the little imp turned round and disappeared through the wall. Well, the days came and the days went, and the girl went all the way through the kingdom, asking people if anybody had seen the imp or knew what he was called, but nobody did. And on the last evening, the girl was so beside herself with worry, she left the little baby with a kind nurse and dressed herself in old clothes and big boots and went walking through the forest to see if she could hear or see anything of the imp. And as luck would have it, just before midnight, she came across a fire in a clearing. She stayed back behind the trees and watched and listened. And there was the little imp, dancing a merry jig. And he'd got a big bottle of wine and was swigging it. And he'd got chicken legs he was eating. And he was going, yes, 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 I shall have a human slave tomorrow. Yes, yes, yes. And then he began to sing a song about how clever he'd been. And he said, and best of all, I shall win this game. For the queen won't know that Rumpelstiltskin is my name. Rumpelstiltskin, thought the queen. Rumpelstiltskin, Rumpelstiltskin. And very quietly she turned and she slipped away through the trees, running back to the palace as fast as she could, all the time saying, Rumpelstiltskin, Rumpelstiltskin, Rumpelstiltskin. And she got back and she wrote it down. And in the morning she was up early. And the imp appeared, but at the front door this time, being escorted in, he said he had an appointment with the Queen and because he wanted it to be very official that he was taking the young prince. So he walked in and everybody stood amazed that the Queen allowed this smelly little imp anywhere close to him. And he held out his hands and said, give me the baby, a bargain is a bargain. And the Queen said, I, I, I've got some names, how many guesses can I have? And the imp thought, hmm. This could be amusing. So he said, you can have 12 guesses. So the Queen said, is it Peter? Nope. Is it George? Nope. Is it Henry? Nope. Is it Harry? Nope. Is it um, Abel? Nope. Is it Francis? Nope. Is it... What shall we have now? Uh, is it Joe? Nope. Is it John? Nope. Is it... Um, she's tried to think of some strange names. Is it Francoise? Nope. Is it... Uh, oh, Petrus? Nope. Is it George of us? 
nope and the little elf the little imp jumped up and grabbed at the baby and said i've got one more guess that was 11 and she looked the little imp close in the eyes and said your name is rumpelstiltskin the little imp's eyes opened wide and he screamed and he shouted and he stamped and he swore and he stamped so hard his foot went right through the floor of the room and then he stamped so hard the other foot went right right through the floor of the room and the floor cracked right apart and he jumped down into it but the girl threw in the box of jewels after for he had worked for her and he did deserve to be paid something and with a roar and a rage of fury the little imp disappeared and the floor slid quietly together with not even a crack left. And the miller's daughter stayed queen for ever and a day. And the little prince grew up to be a fine and wise king. But he never, ever made bargains with imps. Right, my second story is Theseus and the Minotaur. When I was a kid, um, my favourite books of all for reading were Greek and Roman myths and legends. I struggled because they were more or less the same stories with different names, but I decided I liked the Greek ones best. And so um, Theseus and the Minotaur I love because it's so witty. So this is Theseus and the Minotaur. The King Aegeus of Athens... So I'll start again. King Aegeus of Athens had a son, a baby son, with a princess from another kingdom. Her name was Ethra, and she came from Troizen. But for lots of complicated reasons of state, they couldn't get married. And Aegeus went back to Athens, leaving the baby with Ethra. And she was a very good mother, and she brought the baby up well. And because he was a prince, she made sure that the hero, Heracles, trained him in warfare and in how to be brave and how to be strong and just. Now, before the king had left, he had dug a hole and he had put a pair of his best sandals and his best sword into the, so into the hole and had pulled a big stone over the top. And he'd said, when baby Theseus is big enough to move the stone and with his feet fit my sandals and if he can carry my sword then that's time to send him to me and as Theseus grew and grew Ethra thought and thought about the sandals and the sword and the stone and dreaded the day when her little boy would leave him leave her but he was a big boy now in fact he was a very handsome young man and very strong and very brave and very good at everything so she took him out into the field and told him to move the stone and he found the sword and the sandals just as they'd been left and she told them she told Theseus all about his father and how he must now set off for Athens and she said there's a ship in harbour that is leaving tomorrow and it'll take you straight there it's not a long journey and Theseus said I don't want to go by boat I want to go by road and Ezra said but it's so dangerous dear and he said I like danger Heracles has taught me to be brave and to use my weapons and not be afraid of anything. And so I am going by road. And he set off. And on the way he met very strange creatures. And, and on the way he met very strange creatures and monsters, threats to travellers that made the journey so deadly. But every one Theseus defeated, until at last he came to Athens. And he wanted to meet his father without his father knowing who he was. So once he'd got lodgings, he put the sword and the sandals safely away under the bed. And he went to the king and he bowed very deeply and said, Sire, I am a traveller and I'm the son of a noble nobleman and I would like to do you service. Do you have any dangers that you need a hero for? And the king thought and thought. But his queen who was a, a rather nasty, malicious lady, looked from the king to Theseus and thought, they're father and son, and they don't know it. And she whispered to her husband and said, 
I've seen this young man before. Don't trust him. He's come to do you harm. So the king said, Thank you for the warning. And he said to the two, and he said to Theseus, Now, there is an evil bull that roams the wild countryside beyond the town walls. And when people travel across that stretch of countryside, the bull chases after them with his horns low and he gores them. And then he eats them. Bulls don't usually eat human flesh, but in this one they do. And so Theseus said, I'm your man. And he went back to his lodgings and he found his sandals and his sword and he hired a, a vast horse. And he rode out of the city and across the plains until he found this bull grazing on grass. And he drew his sword and yelled, Yay, run for it, I'm out to get you. And the bull took one look at him and charged. But Theseus ran and ran and ran on his horse. Sorry, I'll get that right. And the horse ran and ran and ran with Theseus on its back. Round and round and up uphill and down dale, Theseus chased the bull until the bull began to tire. Then Theseus jumped off his horse and drawing his sword, he lunged at the bull. And the bull was tired. He couldn't move quickly enough. And very soon, Theseus had injured him. He took rope from his saddle, put it round the bull's neck and dragged the animal back to the city. And he took it to the temple of Athene, the goddess of the city, and sent a message to the king saying, I have the bull. I wish to sacrifice it to the goddess Athene. Would you like to come and watch? The king was delighted and he and the queen came down to the temple. And as they were on their way, the queen said, I mean it. Don't let this young man anywhere near him. I know him. He is evil. And then she gave the king a bottle of poisoned wine and said, when he sacrifices the bull, give him this to drink and he will be no more trouble to you. Very pleased, the king took the poisoned wine and they went into the temple and the crowds were there and everybody was cheering because Theseus had killed this dreadful bull or was about to kill this dreadful bull. And the priests were ready, and Theseus raised his sword to perform the sacrifice, and he killed the bull. And as he did so, Aegeus saw the sword and recognised it. And he looked at Theseus' feet and recognised the sandals, and he knew who it was. And he looked at his wife and saw the evil glint in her eye, and he said, that is my son, and you wanted him out of the way. You're going to drink the wine, not him. And he made her drink it until she was really, really ill and dropped down dead. And then the king welcomed Theseus and said, You are my son, you are my heir. That evil queen won't trouble us any more. And Theseus went back to the palace and enjoyed being a prince and he liked his father and his father liked him. But one day a boat came from the island of Crete and in it were soldiers and they started dragging young people out of the marketplace and Theseus marched up and said, what are you doing? You can't just take people. And the soldiers said, yes, we can. Your king and our king have had a row and every three years we come and take seven girls and seven young men to back to Crete, and we have a monster called a Minotaur. The Minotaur, said Theseus, I've heard of that. It's a man with a bull's head. That's right, said the soldiers, and these young people will be fed to the Minotaur, and you've got to do that or we will fight you and you will lose. So Theseus went running back to his dad, and the king said, yes, it's true. And Theseus said, well, let me be one of the young men that go. And Aegeus said, I can't let you do that, I've only just found you. And Theseus said, I must go. I can't let young people die just because of a row between two kingdoms. Very well, said Aegeus, but the ship you go in, I will make sure it has a black sail and a white sail. If you survive, make sure the sailors put a white sail on the ship and I know you are safe. And if you die, I will tell the sailors to put the black sail on. And don't forget. And Theseus said, I won't forget. And he ran down to the ships. 
and he pushed one of the young men out of the way and said, I'm going, you're free. The soldiers didn't care who they took. But seven young men, and seven young men, including Theseus, and six young women were loaded onto the ship, and the king made sure there were white and black sails on board, and they set sail for Crete. When they got there, they were treated very well. There were games and parties. But Theseus knew the day would come when he would have to face the Minotaur. But King Minos, the king of Crete, had a daughter called Ariadne, and she fell head over heels in love with Theseus. And she said to him, when your turn comes, I can't give you weapons because you'll be searched, but she pushed a skein of red silk thread into his hand and said, when you go in, tie this to the door because the, th the Minotaur lives in a labyrinth, a sort of great maze, a puzzle, and there is no way out. No one has ever found a way. The Minotaur lives in there, but once you're in, you won't ever escape. You won't. It's far too cunningly done, and the Minotaur will find you and eat you. But if you have this thread in your hand, you will find a way out. Theseus thanked her and gave her a kiss, and she thought that was wonderful. And then when the time came for the first young man to go to the Minotaur, Theseus said, Me, I'm first. Well, no one argued. And he was led down and pushed inside, and the door slammed, and he found himself in utter blackness. But he remembered he tied the end of the red silk to the door handle and let it out very gently so it didn't break. And he felt his way along the corridor as they twisted and turned this way and that. And the thread was getting a bit short. He was a little bit worried. But then suddenly he found himself in a great circular chamber. And it didn't have a roof. It was open to the sky. And moonlight flooded in. And sitting in the middle was a huge, hideous beast. And when Theseus stepped forward, the beast stood up. And in the moonlight... Theseus saw it had got a great bull's head and a man's body and it was huge and it was hideous and it stank. And Theseus had no weapons, but he ran straight at this creature and thumped it in the chest. The th th creature flung Theseus aside, but Theseus knew how to fall and he jumped up and he pulled at the bull's horns and swung his head round and thumped him in the jaw at the same time. And the great Minotaur was so surprised that someone was fighting back. It staggered and it fell and it hit its head against the wall. And it was dazed. It, it stopped for a moment and, and, and it couldn't get up. And Theseus stepped forward and he grabbed the bull by the, thorn, by the horns and twisted its neck until it cracked. And the Minotaur lay dead. Well, Theseus was over the moon. But how to get back? He had to feel and look and search for ages before he found that thread. But find it he did, and he wound it up very gently and very carefully, going this way and that, until he found the door of the labyrinth. It was early in the morning by now, and Ariadne was waiting outside. It was still dark, just sort of that bit between dark and, and light, so you could sort of see, but not quite. Quickly, she said, I've told everybody else to escape and go down to the boats. They're waiting for us. Don't hang about a minute, because if the soldiers see you've escaped, they will kill us all. So Ariadne led Theseus down to the harbour, and there was the boat with all the friends on it. And they leapt on board, and Theseus said, You must come too, Ariadne, or your father will kill you. And she jumped on board too. And then they let go of the rope and the boats, and they pulled in the oars, and they rowed, and they rowed, and they rowed, and they were well out to sea before anybody noticed that the prisoners had gone and that the Minotaur was dead. Well, the journey was long, and they needed fresh water and food, so they stopped on an island called Naxos, and there they told everybody what had happened, and the king of the island was so pleased he held a great party and everybody ate and drank. Now at that party was Dionysus, the god of alcohol. And they were having quite a lot of alcohol and they were toasting Dionysus. And Dionysus saw Ariadne 
and he, he saw how she and Theseus looked at each other and he was a little bit jealous. So he gave Ariadne a special wine just for her with some herbs in it that sent her to sleep. And then Dionysus crept away with her and hid her. And come the morning, Theseus said, come on everybody, time to get going. And everybody went down to the ship and they got on board and they set off. And then Theseus realised that Ariadne wasn't there. And he looked around and he turned back and went all the way around the island, but he couldn't find her anywhere because Dionysus had hidden her so well. Thinking that maybe she didn't want to be with him after all, she went, he went back on the boat with all his friends. And he was so miserable that he forgot to change the sails from black to white. And of course, Aegeus was watching from a cliff top, looking for those white sails, hoping against hope that Theseus would be all right. And when he saw a ship come into sight, but with black sails, he let out a cry of despair, and he jumped into the sea and died. Now Theseus became king, and he was a good king. And as for Ariadne, she married the god Dionysus, and she became a whole constellation of stars in the heaven as a reward for all her bravery and courage. And Dionysus loved her and she loved him. And Theseus, as a good king and a wise king, also married. And he lived pretty happily ever after. Thank you for listening. I'll be back here.